Good evening, everybody. This is Ware Hart, the Executive Director of Town Hall. And on behalf of our organization, it's a pleasure to be to this program. It's a benefit for Town Hall Seattle featuring Jill Lepore and Hanson Hossein. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And as always these days, we thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is grateful for the opportunity to invite Seattle audiences and well beyond uh, into present tense exchanges of issues, ideas, and creativity, even when we can't do it in person. Town Hall, Town Hall will continue to produce online content throughout the fall and into the new year, and as circumstances allow, even to host live streams from our building. Meanwhile, if you haven't fully gotten tired of Zoom or YouTube yet, many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form on our digital media library. But as for tonight's event, first off, you may know that Jill spoke to Town Hall audiences last night, too, with a completely different moderator about a completely different topic. We asked Jill to do this because I can't think of a more quintessential town hall voice. Curious, courageous, and as an historian and observer, still fundamentally invested in the promise and possibility of this country, despite it all. And so we thank Jill for her incredible generosity to us for spending two nights with us this weekend. And we thank the big bundle of you who decided like you liked last night's event so much, you wanted to hear more from Jill tonight. Okay, so like I said, as for tonight, the program should run around 75 minutes or so in all, starting with a presentation by Jill before she um, uh, is joined by Hanson, who will pose a few questions of his own before opening up to your question, your questions in the Q&A. Use the ask a question field at the bottom center of the screen. And as we like to say, please keep your questions concise so Jill can answer as many as possible. Also know that you can view the event both here on Crowdcast or over on our YouTube page where you can use that platform's closed captioning feature. Town Hall adds new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs that might be of interest include this year's Urban Poverty Forum, our 13th annual. I believe, uh, I think it's the 13th annual, that is focusing on native voter suppression. Michael Denzel Smith with R.O. Kwan, reckoning with who we are as a country and who we want to be, as well as appearances by Senator Sherrod Brown in conversation with County Executive Dow Constantine, Michael Ian Black, Howard Gardner, the brilliant music critic Alex Ross in conversation with the equally brilliant Ann Powers. You'll find plenty more about most of the above posted already online at townhallseattle.org. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civic programs are supported by the Real Networks Foundation, True Brown Foundation, KUOW, and the Wincoat Foundation Northwest. But finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. And as I mentioned at the start, this event is a benefit for our organization. As you likely know, most town hall events are just $5 and many are free. In fact, all are free to anyone 22 and under. Uh, the cost of your ticket tonight gets you both a signed copy of Jill's new book, If Then, which I have to tell you is a rare and beautiful commodity, commodity in this time of digitally mediated everything. So we should all cherish the time and touch and attention and thoughtfulness that went into making that little signature possible. Anyway, your payment tonight gets you a book, a ticket, and the satisfaction of knowing that you helped make this place and this program of ideas and inspiration possible for everybody else out there. If after tonight, you're moved to offer additional support uh, in this time of extraordinary financial stress, we hope you'll consider an additional donation through the demure little donate button at the bottom of the screen right there below me. Or you can go to our website and become a member or text the words town hall to the number 44321 to give. All right. Jill Lepore is the David Woods Kemper, class of 41, professor of American history and affiliate professor of law at Harvard University, where she teaches classes in evidence, historical methods, the humanities and American political history. In 2017, she launched the Democracy Project, Arguing with American History, a course undertaken through weekly debates in which students use primary sources to argue over competing historical interpretations. She's also a staff writer at The New Yorker and host of the podcast, The Last Archive, a kind of wisecracking 40s detective radio drama that poses the question, who killed truth? She's been writing for The New Yorker since 2005 on the subjects of American history, law, literature, and politics. She's been a finalist for the National Book Award and twice for the, Pul for the Pulitzer Prize. And she's the author of over a dozen books. A random sample includes The Secret History of Wonder Woman, published in 2014, which was a national bestseller and winner of the 2015 American History Book Prize. 2018's These Truths, A History of the United States, an international bestseller that was named one of Time Magazine's top 10 fiction books of the decade. Uh, and just last night, she joined us to discuss her most recent book on the history of data collection and its use to manipulate human behavior entitled If Then, How the Simulmatics Corporation Invented the Future. If Then was long listed for the National Book Award for Nonfiction. 
She's in conversation tonight with Hanson Hossein, who's the co-founder of the Communication Leadership Graduate Program at the University of Washington and president of HRH Media Group, LLC, a media production and communication strategy firm. He's presently intent on recalibrating the power dynamic between people and technology as co-principal of MIRA, Mobilize Innovation Reimagine Agency, a community first approach to learning and innovation. Hanson is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and former broadcast journalist, earning an Emmy while working for NBC News in overseas conflict zones. He's the host of the University of Washington's Coexisting with COVID-19 public lecture series and helped spearhead the development of the UW's essential new initiative, the Center for an Informed Public. The history of evidence, our changing understanding of the truth is the topic of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming first Jill Lepore and then our conversation with Hanson Hossein. Thanks so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here again uh, in my bedroom, pretending that I'm in a formal space uh, talking to you about something very serious. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation with Hanson and the questions from all of you this evening. Um, it's a real treat to be able and an honor to be able to support Town Hall Seattle, which is such a vital institution of, you know, of a national treasure in, in so many different ways, even more treasured. Uh, for the time now that we can't be in it. Um, so thanks all of you for your support. Um, I have a whole lot of slides that I'm gonna show this evening. Um, I'm gonna give a, a, a little bit of an academic lecture, but hopefully it is also fun. What I wanna do is um, give a kind of, um, do you remember the, uh, the the annotated, complete annotated works of William Shakespeare play, which is like all the Shakespeare plays in, in 60 minutes. I'm gonna kind of try to give this semester long course that I give at the Harvard Law School on the history of evidence. Oh, uh, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes. So we'll see, we'll see how this goes. Um, but what I, what I wanna try to do, if we could go to the next slide. The miraculous is everywhere in our home. I wanna begin with this. And share every second in data dressed as pixels. A billion roaming photojournalists uploading the human experience, and it is spectacular. So why would you cap that? My iPhone 5 can see every point of view, every panorama, the entire gallery of humanity. I need to upload all of them. I need, no, I have the right to be unlimited. Only Sprint offers truly unlimited data for iPhone 5. So I just want to begin with this, begin with this very ordinary thing, a television ad, or I, like this was on, uh, this was on YouTube, an ad for a data plan. Um, I'm gonna come back to this ad, we'll listen to it again, and I wanna ask you to, to hear it uh, again and think more carefully about what you're hearing here. But there's some language in this ad that gets to the heart of what I wanna talk about tonight, which is the evolution of ideas and the history of ideas about evidence, and especially of the elemental units in which we hold knowledge. Um, this is an ad that celebrates data uh, in the form of of pictures that can be compiled by ordinary people. But it engages in the language of rights. We have the right to unlimited data. And it also engages uh, in the language of the miraculous or, or, or the mysterious. Uh, so the argument that I'm gonna try to lay out for us this evening by looking at a lot of different things, a lot of pop culture things as well, uh, is that, yeah, we could stay at that slide, um, is that we, we would do well analytically, at least for purposes of thinking clearly about our current crisis, epistemological crisis, where it's hard to know how to know anything anymore, to think historically about what is the kind of container that we hold evidence in? What is it called? So I wanna argue that we can see a transformation historically from the fact as the elemental unit of knowledge to the number as the elemental unit of knowledge to the age that we live in now, which is the age of data. So next slide. I want to just propose to you that using a data set, uh, the Google Ngram data set, the corpus of English language books, I can at least try to demonstrate to you visually that there is some pattern here that can be that can be discerned by the use of a large data set uh, in how frequently we use the words facts, numbers, and data, and what, how those have changed over time. So we can go ahead again. So to the next slide. Again, what I'm trying to argue is that these are not just analytical categories, like three different bins. There's evidence that comes in the form of facts. There's evidence that comes in the form of numbers. There's evidence that comes in the form of data, but that this is a sequence, a chronological sequence, an evolution over time, that that the, the fact has largely been replaced by the number, which is being replaced by data. So we go to the next slide. 
there's a kind of underlying argument as well that I, I, I will hint at here, but won't fully be able to uh, unpack for you, which is that same sequence can be seen if we look at the evolution of mystery, secrecy, and privacy. That is to say, what facts do is penetrate mysteries. Uh, what data does is in some ways is, is kind of violate, what numbers do is violate secrecy and what, pri what data does is violate privacy. That there are these other kind of categories of the unseen or the hidden or, uh, or the secreted, the invisible, that lie behind our understandings of these units of knowledge. So to the next slide, please. So here are some claims for those of you, those of you who really miss being in a college lecture hall, which I'm hoping is some small group. I, I would make a series of claims here this evening, that the fact has been overrun by the number and it is being supplanted by data. Next, please. Much that was once mysterious became secret and then it became private. Next, please. And that in the, consequent, in the course of these transformations happening, the inviolability of the self has replaced the inscrutability of God. So I hope your mind's not blowing up thinking, why, why am I this crazy high philosophical set of uh, lecture with these, with these strange disquisitions? But I'm going to try to illustrate these claims uh, as vividly as possible to you. And then you can dispute them in the Q&A. So we're going to begin with facts. And as the first of these elemental units of knowledge, and I will claim that the end of this unit of knowledge, its object, is truth. The reason we use facts is determine what is to determine what is true. Next slide, please. Historians of the law point out that the fact as a unit of evidence really comes from the law and it comes from a very specific time and place in med medieval England in, in the Anglo-American tradition and uh, the abolition of trial by ordeal in the year 1215 when it was abolished by the Pope. Before 1215, uh, if, if a crime were committed, the way, the only real form of criminal investigation and of judgment was a trial by ordeal. Uh, you would, you would dunk somebody in the water. You would burn them with boiling water to see if the blisters became infected. Um, you could do a trial by combat and have someone confront some, engage in a fight. These, they were kind of, they were basically just contrivances to make it possible for God to communicate the guilt or innocence of the accused. The premise of trial by ordeal is that man cannot know the guilt or innocence of another man. Only God can know. That is to say, a, a trial by ordeal aims to confront the problem of mystery. A mystery is something that only God can know and we cannot. So trial by ordeal makes it possible for God to send a message to us by way of is the woman gonna drown while, while being ducked, say. But in 1215, when trial by ordeal was abolished, we could go to the next slide. Uh, it was replaced in England with trial by jury, largely because the Magna Carta happened to be written and signed by King John that same year, uh, in which the, the practice of trial by jury, which had only previously been uh, deal with boundary disputes, would be used to decide on of the guilt or innocence, innocence of an accused criminal. This is a huge epistemological shift. So a jury, 12 random men, can now decide the guilt or innocence of another man. Um, it, it's a transformation that never really entirely stuck, um, but the, the work of the jury then was determine the facts in the case. A fact is an observed act or deed. Right, so that so they're, 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 what trial by jury did with the fact-finding mission of the jury was establish over time a set of rules of evidence. There could be no hearsay. There need to be eyewitnesses. Circumstantial evidence isn't enough. All the rules of evidence that are the ancestors of the rules of evidence in a modern criminal court came from that move. Right, so this whole universe of constraint around knowledge involving corroboration, observation. Go to the next slide, please. This, uh, the, the rise of trial by jury in many ways contributed to the Protestant Reformation, which was an assault on the idea of mystery, the mystery of the Catholic Church, right? Uh, that the mystery is, is the wisdom of God, that things that can only be known by God or in the realm of the Catholic Church by priests is increasingly questioned uh, with the idea that Ordinary people, ordinary men, mortals can discover the facts themselves. Some things, some some mysteries will yield to facts. Next slide, please. The Protestant Reformation, of course, precedes the English Reformation, which is the challenge of the divine right of kings by Parliament and by rebelling Englishmen 
who object to King James, who, who embrace the idea that his power was a mystery, like the power of God, like the power of the Pope. Remember, in the Reformation, the King of England became the head of the Catholic Church. So the King of England was also like a Pope because he was a religious leader. And so increasingly, English kings started claiming that they, they had these divine rights. And James did that more than any other and said that his power <clears throat> could not be disputed because it was a mystery, like the power of God. Next slide. Uh, so much of the political philosophy, the incredible outbursting of political philosophy in 17th and 18th century England had to do with challenging the mystery of the, of the power of, of the king. And this, what historians of the law and historians of science say is that the, the culture of the fact, the idea that uh, you could assemble a body of evidence and evaluate it um, using strict rules to, 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 to tell which evidence is admissible and which is not moved over the course of those centuries from the 13th century to say the 18th century, moved from the courts into many other realms of human experience, including the study of history. Somehow now the body of evidence that is the historical record becomes a set of facts on which history is written and, and therefore has a kind of empirical claim, which is a wholly new thing in the, in the writing of history. Next slide, please. That notion that there are such things as facts that can be observed uh, then spills out gradually into the emerging field of journalism. It's certainly not called journalism at the time, but printers, including Benjamin Franklin, very much embrace this idea of a trial by a trial of the facts. So our notion of the freedom of the press and freedom of speech depends on this idea that what a printer should do, as Franklin made clear, and I hope you guys can read the text here. As Franklin made clear, was print both print everyone's opinions because in a fair fight, truth and between truth and error, truth will always win. So the printer's job is never to censor, but to let truth and error uh, fight it out on a on a fair field. Uh, that it that 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 is, and the reader will be the juror. The reader has that role of evaluating uh, the truth of the matter through the observing of those facts. So next slide, please. So it's, it's useful to remember how dominant this notion of uh, the, the, the prevalence of the fact, the culture of the fact was to the founding of the United States, which is among other things, an act of empiricism. So the framers uh, and the patriots who, who wrote the founding documents refer again and again and again to an enlightenment version of this culture of the fact that politics too submits to the trial of facts. Uh, common sense engages in this language. Next slide, please. Uh, which is prevalent all throughout the 18th century. Next slide. That ordinary, the idea that, you can go to the next slide. That ordinary people can discern the truth of the matter. I'm, ordinary people can discern the truth of the matter by way of inspecting the facts. The Declaration of Independence is a list of facts that says, let Jefferson writes, let facts be submitted to a candid world. You know, the world will be the juror of the rightness of our cause because we believe in the freedom of the press. We will just state what we have observed and truth will prevail here. Uh, the next slide. You see a kind of democratizing of that set of ideas with the emergence of the penny press in the 1830s, when even poor men, working class men in the beginnings of the industrial age can buy a newspaper, can submit the claims of elected officials to their own inspection. Next slide, please. Tocqueville referred to the United States as essentially a democracy of facts, that it was a kind of unique thing about Americans that they wanted to decide for themselves on political matters, that this, this practice of democracy, the need to inspect all the evidence, the, the belief in one's own ability to discern the truth by looking at watching the truth and lies do battle in the newspaper, that's the work of being a citizen in democracy. And Americans had this kind of unusual commitment to the idea that they could do this, or unusual confidence that they could do this. Next slide, please. At the same time, uh, the, the, the mystery, the idea of mystery returned in a wholly new way in the way that we now, we, when we talk about a mystery, we usually mean something like an Edgar Allan Poe story um, or P.D. James mystery, right? Which is, which really, which is something that is inscrutable and at first seems to be supernatural, something that is only, can, can only be understood by God in that older meaning. 
but even mysteries <laughs> like uh, the point of the mystery now in the world of fiction is for us to solve it to to reduce the supernatural to the natural world to submit it to natural laws to the inspection you know of our own reason and empiricism next slide please i'm going to skip this we'll go right ahead to the next slide so uh, that that whole uh, fascination with mystery uh, he produces first with Poe, but then later with writers like uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, the, the character of the detective. To detect something is to like lift the roof off of something. It should, a detectives pry into the private lives of people. Uh, by the 19th century, a middle class had an experience of private life uh, that could be penetrated by people like detectives who were private eyes, who could turn mysteries and you could reduce mysteries to facts. There's this obsession by the 1880s with the work of the detective. Next slide, please. Uh, which become, is really closely related to continuing the work of law, but also here's the, the great attorney for the damned, Clarence Darrow. Uh, there is, in the, in the, this is the very early progressive era, the emergence of the social sciences, a real commitment to talking uh, that, that ordinary people um, can discern, uh, can, can themselves be detectives, not just citizens who discern the facts, but that they can be detectives if aided by muckraking journalists. This is the beginning of the age of muckraking journalists who do that detective work as well. Next slide, please. So it'll be fun to talk to Hanson about this, but a lot of the ethics of journalism as they evolved and were dominant for most of the 20th century come from the 1890s with this obsession with facts. Uh, that you know that has been very long in coming, but has kind of reached its peak. Like the, I would argue that the rise of the fact, uh, which begins in 1215, really reaches reaches a peak around 1900 with this particular journalistic notion uh, that everything, every sentence must must contain a certain number of facts. Next slide, please. Because you're looking at a straight shooter, America. I tell it like it is. I calls them like I sees them. I will speak to you in plain, simple English. And that brings us to tonight's word, truthiness. <laughs> now, I'm sure some of the word police, the wordanistas over at Webster's are going to say, hey, that's not a word. Well, anybody who knows me know that I'm no fan of dictionaries or reference books. They're elitist, constantly telling us what is or isn't true or what did or didn't happen. Who's Britannica to tell me the Panama Canal was finished in 1914? If I want to say it happened in 1941, that's my right. I don't trust books. Okay, we could stop that there and go to the next slide. I'm sorry, I know the, the videos are a little bit wonky. Um, so what I want to ask us, the reason I wanted to remind us of how young Stephen Colbert was in 2005 is, What's puzzling then is what happened between say about 1900 when all those newspapers editors were saying facts, 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 we want nothing but facts. And a century later in 2005 when Colbert's satire is pointing out that, that journalism and public culture as a whole is in a tremendous crisis around what even is a fact, what is true, that it's, it's somehow become really a mushy thing. Uh, we think of this, you know, the kind of cry, this particular crisis is quite recent. It's, it really does date to uh, the time of the Iraq war. That is the current conversation about truthiness and, and the post-fact era, the beginnings of these kind of online fact-checking services, next slide, uh, including automated fact-checking services, which purport to be able to use algorithms to tell what's true and what's not true. Next slide, please. So um, what I wanna suggest is that what happened in that century uh, was in included the rise of numbers and the replacement of the culture of the fact with the culture that preferred numbers. And numbers, unlike the fact whose, no, whose objective is truth, the objective of numbers, I would claim here, notionally is power. So next slide. Of course, people have always counted things and numbers are ancient. So I don't mean to say numbers start in the year 1900, obviously. So I'm talking about something a little bit different. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I want us to think uh, about how important numbers are for the counting of people, uh, because that's what I'm in one of the ways that I think that numbers really matter in, in the political history that we're looking at here. Next slide, please. I'll go to the next slide. Skip this. 
So uh, a census is, there, there are censuses in the Bible. Censuses are an ancient thing. Uh, early Americans thought that censuses, censuses were um, profane and refused to participate in them, which lead, means that we don't have a lot of information about populations in the colonies. Um, next slide, please. But um, by the 18th century, quantitative science had advanced to the point that the, what was, comes to be called the science of statistics has emerged. Statistics are numbers that are kept by the state, uh, that, that, that are the numbers that help the state ex exercise its authority over a people. And those numbers include counting the people, counting manufacturers, counting houses, counting animals, doing censuses, and also constructing an understanding of the economy. And increasingly by the 18th century, coming to understand life expectancy and what we would think of as kind of actuarial tables, understanding the population in a minute way. Uh, there's a kind of great fascination with the possibility that numbers could explain human behavior uh, as an enlightenment idea. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a description of the emergence of statistical science. Next slide, please. Uh, so my point, though, is that the United States was founded at a time when statistics was being born. And in many ways, the founding of the United States presented, of course, a mathematical problem. Among them was the problem of whether how to count enslaved people in a system of government that was meant to be representative. The Articles of Confederation really just count the states for representation purposes. And there's a big debate about the difficulty of counting the population. Uh, because whether or not to count slaves, Franklin famously says, sheep will never make an insurrection in answer to the question, how would you know whether you should also count animals? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, among the solutions, mathematical solutions that are offered during the debate at the Articles of Confederation is to count enslaved people as three-fifths uh, the, the value of, uh, of a free person that ends up being part of the Constitution. Next slide, please. Um, and is incorporated, of course, into the Electoral College as well. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, it's, the point I'm trying to make here is that our modern American democracy is the first system of government that is founded in the age of demography. It requires demography. We we are required, it's a constitutional mandate to conduct the census in order that we have the mathematically accurate proportionate representation required in our uh, House of Representatives and also in the Electoral Congress. Next slide, please. Uh, but this, uh, this era, this fascination with an urgency around counting everything by the 1830s in the age of industrialization was increasingly associated with industrial capitalism and the counting that capitalists did and manufacturers did and factory owners did to extract labor from their employees in much the same way that slave owners extracted labor from the, the people that they owned and also counted and whose political power they assumed um, and led to an enormous amount of like Thoreau's kind of critique of that numeracy, Charles Dickens's critique of that numeracy, which I'm just using here to illustrate its prominence culturally, how everything seemed to be about numbers. Next slide. Um, that quantification of political behavior made a new turn in the 20th century with the rise of public opinion polling, uh, which really uh, has its origins in 1935 with the founding of the American Institute of Public Opinion, where counting people is the business of uh, a for-profit industry which purports to supplant in some ways the existing technologies of democracy, that, that a poll will do the work that mm, the candidates, representatives going around the neighborhoods and asking people what kinds of things they're interested in, uh, that the poll could supplant that. Next slide, please. Oh, don't be a fool, Rip. You're in no position to be fussy. You and your mathematical miracles. Look at the job this is from Act. No wonder he canceled your contract. We released our figures uh, today on the same subject. Look at it. You weren't even close. You can't do polls without national coverage, Rip. And that takes money, a lot of money. Make up your mind, there are no shortcuts. All right, we can skip this and go to the, go to the next slide. Um, this is a great and long forgotten Jimmy Stewart film from 1947 in which Stewart plays a pollster who is really struggling with how to best mathematically represent the American population. 
uh, and he finds this magic town of 3,000 people that happen to be a perfect demographic representation of the American population. And so instead of doing polling, he moves to the town and he just like goes to the barbershop and asks people what they think. Um, it's a really interesting kind of throwback to old style politicking um, and expressed a lot of cultural anxiety about polling, which was well placed because of course in the following years, presidential election, all the pollsters got it wrong. Next slide, please. I, I spend so much time on the counting of people and of pollsters because this particular kind of uh, numerical knowledge is so central to our political crisis today. That is our reliance on pollsters, which critics at the time understood to be undermining American democracy. During the very emergence of the polling industry, there were lots of really powerful critiques of it. Uh, but it was too appealing to be stopped. And it, and it and has, of course, become a much bigger industry in the years since. Next slide, please. That work, though, of, of counting was greatly aided by the advent of mainframe computers. Um, that is the sake for the sake of counting people and counting voters. That's what my new book is largely about. But it began making inroads to journalism as early as 1973. Uh, with the publication of a book called Precision Journalism, in which this guy who'd been a, a Neiman Fellow and spent some time at MIT while he was at Harvard, came to believe that every newspaper should have its own mainframe computer to study the electorate, um, to do to do to run numbers, and to basically have an internal polling organization of its own. Uh, this advice was certainly heeded. 1975 is the first time that a news organization conducted its own poll, and it was a New York Times CBS News poll. At the time, people said news organizations should not conduct polls. It's, it's completely unethical. It has nothing to do with uh, reporting the news that is making the news. Um, there's That was another set of ethical objections. It was just waved aside because it's sold a lot of newspapers to do polls. Um, we can talk more, but I'm gonna skip these slides about the place of polling in our politics today, and in particular in our primary presidential campaigns. Next slide, next slide. Next slide. <laughs> and that's one brush swing. You want to cook you with that? All right, we can go to the next slide. So you, I, a lot of you may have watched Black Mirror, the anthology program. This is its most famous episode, Nosedive. It's about a near future world in which every person, every living human being has a number that is constantly uh, in, flu in flux as people around you in a, in a a fully integrated social media way evaluate their encounters with you if they if they like the tip you gave them at the coffee shop you it's kind of like an uber five for five but it's the whole world every encounter involves getting this number and what number you have determines whether which part of the airplane you get a seat on it determines more of an office building you're allowed to work on um it's it's a, it's a it's a it, it's a not too far stretch about a dystopia in which our dependency on evaluating people by numbers and doing that kind of counting uh, has completely upended any form of genuine human contact. Um, that's not where we are, <laughs> um, but it is actually, if you think about the trajectory of the acquisition of power through the counting of people and the ranking and sorting of people uh, in a modern democracy and the divisions that are enforced by way of uh, direct to voter micro targeting. I think you can see where that dystopia is coming from. So I want to talk now about the rise of data. This is the last little <laughs> section section of this talk. I'm going to try to go through this quickly. Um, and if any of you were at the talk uh, last night about if then and in Simulmatics Corporation, this will be familiar to you. But my my argument about the emergence of data as an as an evidentiary category, as an elemental unit of knowledge. Obviously, all these things can be called data. You could call anything data. But what I mean by data here is a body of numbers that uh, are, are too big and on which you would need to do two complex mathematical calculations for a human being to do it requires a machine to do it. So the objective of acquiring data and using it is, is prediction. We can skip the matrix. Everybody knows that the matrix is about numbers. In the end, it is about a computer simulation of all of the human condition. I want to make this somewhat surprising argument that we might think of data in its association with the emergence of photography. 
Um, so and in the in particular in the U.S. with regard to the history of slavery, it was a problem for abolitionists that they that they had a hard time representing the brutality of the institution of slavery. They did things like make picture books. Next slide, please. Uh, they did things like print runaway slave ads as if they had witnesses. Uh, as, as if these runaway slave ads were a body of evidence that they could that they could use, which is very hard to convince white Northerners that slavery was was as brutal as people who had seen slavery knew it to be. It was almost like behind an iron curtain. Next slide. Frederick Douglass thought that the the photograph, that a technology that emerged in 1839, could lift that curtain and could show not only the brutality of slavery, but the humanity of black men and women. That photography was a form of evidence that was unlike any that had come before. Next slide, please. He was a passionate technological optimist in an era where uh, there was also a great deal of concern about photography as, uh, as a new kind of private eye that could see inside of people, which is among the concerns of the work of H.G. Wells, who writes The Invisible Man in this era. Next slide, please. Uh, the Invisible Man is made into a film oh, quite a bit later, and I'm not sure if the next slide is the film, but I need to set it up for you. Uh, if you haven't seen the film, The Invisible Man is holed up in a in an inn. He's he's a chemist who's mis made himself invisible by accident, and he's trying to um, uh, restore himself physically, but he's going mad because he's invisible, and also the chemicals are making him mad. He's begun to harm people, and the police have come to break in on him in his room. And what I want you to listen for and look for here is the relationship um, between photography and being seen here in the film um, and privacy. There's an obsession with privacy in the United States in the 1890s and also in the UK. <laughs> Get back, you kids, there! Yeah, what's all this? Keep back there. Keep back, me? Do you know who you're talking to? I give you a last chance to leave me alone. Give me a last chance. You've committed assault, this what you've done, and you can come along to the station with me. Come along now, come quietly, unless you want me to put the handcuffs on. Stop where you are. You don't know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing, all right. Come on. Get all of it. Lock him up. All right, you fools. You've brought it on yourselves. Everything would have come right if you'd only left me alone. You've driven me near madness with your peering through the keyholes and gaping through the curtains. And now you'll suffer for it. You're crazy to know who I am, aren't you? All right, I'll show you. There's a souvenir for you. And one for you. I'll show you who I am and what I am. <laughs> Look, he's all eaten away. Huh? How do you like that, eh? <laughs> Okay, so if you've seen, if you've listened to my podcast, I have a whole episode about that scene. Um, I, I'm kind of obsessed with the Invisible Man in the movie. But my point here is that the camera, uh, which for Douglas was central to uh, the progress toward human equality because it exposed the equality of all human beings, was for a white middle class something terrible and terrifying because it exposed the inside of you, um, because it violated your privacy and it made you crazy to be seen. So our right to privacy as an idea, as a constitutional idea, comes from an essay written in 1890 by Louis Brandeis, who goes on to be uh, join the Supreme Court, and his law partner, Samuel Warren. And they, they're, they're obsessed with the inviolability of the self. Um, that, 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 that we all somehow have a right to be unseen. And what, we can do the next slide. The risk of violating our privacy comes from modern technologies. And this is kind of where I'm kind of getting to um, how we can think about data and, and photography and especially the emergence of film um, as a form of data collection about 
people. I, I'm going to have to skip through this. So you're going to have to kind of either stipulate this or just raise your eyebrows and wonder whether I can make this case if I had more time. Um, but that the camera it generates itself uh, a whole concern with privacy as an, as an idea, as data about people becomes increasingly collected. Next slide. Go to the next slide. I'm going to have to skip this evidence of the film so we can skip the next two slides, which are which is which is about moving pictures and how they can see what we cannot see. But we'll go keep going through that. Um, but I want to just talk briefly about psychology because experimental psychology takes that work very seriously. That is to say, it is a discipline whose objective is to see inside the minds of people, right? To do that thing that is so upsetting to the invisible man, to be seen on the inside, which is you know, one of the great anxieties of, of, the, of the modern era. But one of the ways that experimental psychologists try to see the inside uh, is um, by the use of film and by the use of machines that collect data. So William Moulton Marston seen here with a model invents the lie detector at Harvard in its experimental laboratory in, 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 as, as a college student. And we're gonna see a clip of him with this machine that he believes, he, what Marston wanted to do is replace trial by jury with trial by lie detector, because he believed he had invented a machine that could collect enough data and process it that could tell the difference between the truth and a lie, and therefore jurors were obsolete. Um, he later becomes this guy working in Hollywood. Oh, you can go, we should go back and see that. Dr. Marston and Emotions. It's 18th of July, 1930, and Dr. William Marston demonstrates complicated device whereby he claims he can determine and compute comparative emotions of blondes, brunettes, and redheads, says Marston. Okay, that, that's enough, that's enough. <laughs> I'm sorry, we, I could really love, to, really love to show you that clip, but I wanna suggest that this turn to the age of data, which kind of comes from photography and cinematography, uh, is really closely associated with a whole lot of complicated sexual and racial politics, which that clip of Marston suggests for you. We could think about the, the role then of the camera in the life of Ralph, Ralph Ellison, who worked as a photographer while writing Invisible Man, a novel about invisibility. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, and it's at just the time that Invisible Man comes out, the Ellison novel in 1952, that the first mainframe computers are available. Next slide including the UNIVAC, which is developed for the US Census Bureau. So by 1951, the, the data as the elemental unit of knowledge really has in a meaningful sense uh, come to vie with the fact and the number for supremacy. Um, I think the next slide might be a clip from a movie. So I'm gonna set up the movie and this is the last, I think the last clip we're gonna look at, um, which is a film called Desk Set from 1957 starring Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepper and Tracy plays an MIT computer scientist engineer guy who's uh, developed this UNIVAC-like computer system called MRAC. Catherine Hepburn runs a fact-checking department. So it's the movie is 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 it is a it is written for my argument here. It is it is it is data defeating the fact as the elemental unit of knowledge. Um, so we're we're going to watch a scene where Spencer Tracy has invited the chair the, the the board members to come watch a demonstration of the ability of his MRAC computer to work more quickly than women doing fact checking. So what you're looking for is the relationship between facts and data and the sexual politics of men and machines and women. So this is just a still shot. I think the next one is the clip. Good morning, ladies. Uh, all you boys know Miss Watson, of course. Well, gentlemen, there she is, Emma Rack, the modern miracle. Uh, Mr. Sumner, would you mind explaining just- No, 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 no. Oh. Barbara, how's it been going? Oh, Miss Emmy is digesting everything just beautifully, Mr. Sumner. Good, good. Now, gentlemen, uh, the purpose of this machine, of course, is to free the worker. You can say that again. Uh, to free the worker from the routine and repetitive tasks and liberate his time for more important work. Now, for example, uh, uh, you see all those books there and the ones up there? Well, every fact in them has been fed into Emmy. Now, uh, what do you have there? This is Hamlet. That's Hamlet? Yes, the entire text. In code, of course. Uh, uh, now, these little cards create electronic impulses which are accepted and retained by the machine so that in the future, if anybody calls up and wants a quotation from Hamlet, the 
research worker types it into the machine here, and he goes to work, and the answer comes out here. And it never makes a mistake. Well, <laughs> now that's not entirely accurate. Emmy can make a mistake. <laughs> Uh, but only if the human element makes the mistake first. Okay. Uh, tell me, Bunny, uh, has Emrak been helping you any? Well, frankly, it hasn't started to give yet. For the past two weeks, we've just been feeding it information. But I think you could safely say that it will provide more leisure for more people. Thank you, Miss Well. Not at all. Thank you. <laughs> now, I wonder, uh, is there any questions that one of you gentlemen would like to ask the machine? I have a question. Oh, what is it? The spruce bud worm. How much damage is done annually to the American forest by the spruce bud worm? Ah, oh, Miss Warren. That took me three weeks. I know, I know. How much damage is done annually to American forests by the spruce bud worm? What was the answer, Bunny? Remember? $138,464,359 and uh, uh, some cents. Well, now let's see what Emmy has to say. $138,464,359 and 12 cents. Okay, next slide. So just to point out, we could still, we could find that answer now in a different way. Next slide. Next slide. And that the founders of Google believe uh, that we wouldn't need an MRAC to find the answer to that question soon enough. I'll go to the next slide. Um, so again, uh, I've tried to sort of show the evolution from mystery to fact to number to data. I'm not gonna go through this elaborate chart. Next slide, please. The miraculous is everywhere, in our home, our minds. But I think as you listen to this now, you can hear... Uh, million roaming photojournalists uploading the human experience, and it is spectacular. So why would you cap that? My iPhone 5 can see every point of view, every panorama, the entire gallery of humanity. I need to upload all of me. I need, no, I have the right to be unlimited. Only Sprint offers truly unlimited data for iPhone 5. I hope that at the end of this lecture, you have some sense of what so struck me about that ad. Um, and uh, I guess my last slide here that's come up is I know that at the end of my talk, uh, I wrote this in an article once that was about the history of the fact. And someone put it up on a billboard in San Francisco and a friend of mine took a picture of it for me. So I'm gonna end on that note. Thanks very much. And uh, Hanson, let's, let's go. Let's hope they bring me up here. Uh, oh, good. Well, that was um, that was epic, Jill. And I felt like, uh, you know, on a Saturday evening when we're all confined to home, we could be watching Netflix, but this was much better. And I'm glad you referenced my favorite Netflix episode uh, from Black Mirror, which is Nosedive, and it's definitely required required viewing. Um, your, your, your lecture really inspired three lines of inquiry. I want to go to the first one, which is based on what you and I were talking about even before we started today, which is baseball related. Um, so here's a softball question for you. If we're <laughs> drawing this line between facts to data with uh, numbers in between, was really, I found it very poignant. I felt, I, this felt very sad to me, like it was an ode to facts. And it occurred to me in the last few weeks as I've been watching baseball return, that you know, when you're watching on television, you can watch the umpire, umpire make a call on the pitch. You can also watch the television network use an AI and an algorithm and some kind of radar to tell you exactly where that ball went. Yeah. My question to you, based on the, the point of your, your, your talk, is why do we still have umpires when we can actually totally get the accurate call from machines? Yeah. I remember when the Red Sox started doing that. I think it's called the Amica Pitch Box on, on our network. Um, I was really mad about it because I was like, "Come on, I like to question the ump. I don't want to also. I don't want to be able to not question the. You know, like how can I question like the the this like correct thing is already questioning it or supporting the call. Um, but now I kind of love the Amica pitch box thing. So, um, I it's you know the MLB has had a big debate about this, right? Whether they would go to that. I think even this year because of the COVID compromise. I mean, umps and the catchers are so close together. Um, I mean, 
because baseball is the most sentimental sport is I think the only reason that we still, so the whole sport just stands, it rides on a horse named nostalgia you know, across every field. Um, but I, I suspect the ump's days are numbered. But it seems so to, to me that based on the argument you're making that you would actually want to keep the ump no matter what, because you want that argument, you want the mystery there, as opposed to having the data refute everything, right? The fact relies lies in the umpire, not in the machine. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't, I'm not a Luddite. Like I, I, you know, thank God for a thousand machines that have made our lives a gazillion different ways better. I mean, it's not like all machines are bad, but I think what we don't pay attention to is the loss of human contact, the, 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 the aggregated cost of the loss of human contact. So for instance, the polling industry, you know, it used to be if you were running for office, like let's say you're running for city council and you have a, a, a ward that you're running from, you know, you're not at large, you're from a ward, you'd walk around and talk to people a lot or you'd get campaign workers who'd walk around and talk to people a lot. And then you decide maybe what streets you maybe needed to go spend some time drinking at the bar. But if you have pollsters who are doing that work, you know, they're making a quick phone call or now they're doing some of the analytics or whatever on the population, you're not doing that walking around and talking to those people. And cumulatively, all those conversations that are about energizing the electorate, understanding your constituents, getting, you know, it, it's the social cohesion and the social fabric piece of that that you lose. Now, you might get a better read on the electorate, but the electorate doesn't have a lot of, you know, you're not just kind of standing around at the playground talking with a mom with her three kids or, you know, a, a dad with his husband and their new baby. Like, you're not having those conversations. Maybe you're still as good an elected official, but the community has really suffered for the extraction of that human exchange for something that, sure, like can actually, I'm not gonna die, like, the Amica pitch zone is better than the umps in, the, in major leagues. Like I just, I, there's some bad umps out there. But the experience of recognizing our own fallibility, wondering about how does this guy still have his job? Like the emotional engagement with the game, like that's what makes us human. Like was it, is it, is it so crucial to baseball that every pitch be called accurately? I don't think so. Like I think the loss is too great. How do we make those calls? I mean just in so many realms in our world, those calls are always made for efficiency and cost. Well, that's exactly the answer I wanted to hear from you. That was perfect. I love the fact that you were still making um, the argument for the human element and that the community does matter because that's the challenge we've been facing with technology is that we think that every problem now can be solved by technology. And, and what I've noticed is that technology just amplifies existing human forces and can make it worse, it can make it better. So I, I'm glad you made the call for the empire. So my second guess, question- can, can I just jump in with like, I think that the, the, the judge who rejected the lie detector um, when it was brought to court as, an, as evidence said, Look, here's the thing, he kind of said, here's the thing, the jury doesn't always get it right, but like, that's how we experience the law and we participate in our judicial system. Like, if you just sent a criminal to be defended, like just to, the trial took place in front of a machine and the machine decided, who would believe in our system of laws? Like, it, the, it, it's too bad that juries get things wrong. We should make them do better job. You know, we hope they can prove that, but the, the loss is incredible. But there's a case where that what didn't happen, right? Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad we didn't. Um, I felt like you were sending me coded messages during your lecture in terms of things you wanted to go deeper on during our conversation. So I'm going to try this one. First of all, I love your your the, the premise you made around photography being the first attempt at data in America, and I think that's really powerful. And then you talked a bit about ethics in the 1890s and journalism. And what's interesting to me is that um, Pulitzer and Hearst, Randolph Hearst, were both considered what they called yellow journalists back in that period. And and very much, I, I've always thought that objectivity and hard fact journalism is very much an aberration in the history of journalism. It only happened in the latter half of the 20th century. But back then, those were the MSNBCs and Fox News of our time. And there's yeah. that famous quote from, uh, I think it's apocryphal, but, but Randolph Hearst in the Spanish-American War, he says, you furnish me the pictures, I'll furnish you the war. So there is, I'm combining yeah. two things you've talked about, photography and the fact that there wasn't that much ethics during that particular period of time. And people- No, 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 it's all, it's a lot like, um, 
I don't know what it is now, but when Fox News was founded, its its slogan was fair and balanced. Yeah. And it was like, but it was founded to not be fair. Like that is exactly the MSNBC Fox News thing is, you know, the Pulitzer's New York world. And um, they talk the talk a lot. Like, so sort of trying to chronicle this thing that had really mattered, you know, in law and in the enlightenment and in kind of democratizing politics is now just a like, like a thing you put on your mast masthead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. Okay. I agree good. with you. And then I think my final line of inquiry is as I, my, the big picture thing that I was extracting from this is that, uh, you know, the whole evolution of facts, which didn't seem to be a very long part of our history in, in, in proportion to everything else that's happened is it really came about because of gatekeepers and elites, you know, kings and Magna Carta and founding fathers and editors of newspapers. And it felt very much like, well, we were good with facts when it was a small number of people within a tribe that sort of said, this is the facts, everybody else follow along with it. And when that tribe starts to fall apart or when there are competing tribes because of internet, social media, whatever else, that's when we begin to really contest whether facts are even possible. So I'm just curious whether that ever occurred to you as you were doing, as you're putting this lecture together, is just looking at the pictures of the people who champion facts over history. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is a much more complicated story than my crazy mad cap lecture can allow. But I do think, and I think I argue this to some in some places in the podcast, that what happens over the 20th century is that the community of people who are allowed to know things, you know, by elites somehow grows, right? Even just serving on a jury, a juror is a fact finder. Even after say women get the right to vote in 1920, most states don't allow women to serve on juries until the 1940s or 1950s. And it's only because the men are off at the war and there just aren't enough men to staff juries. So like women don't have knowledge that matters before the law in that way. There is, for much of American history, a legal category known as Negro evidence, which is um, before emancipation, black people cannot testify in court unless they're testifying against a person of a darker skin color than themselves or an, a, you know, a, another black person or a blacker person. Um, they can't testify against it for a crime. They can't testify against a white defendant. But the category of evidence that's allowed when they are allowed is called Negro evidence. It's this bizarre thing. like statuarily black people are not allowed to know things. I mean, it's this, the vastness of that as an epistemological claim and how much of this world of knowledge hinges on that in say, you know, the United States for a full couple of centuries. Um, so what you see in the 20th century then is like, wow, people, you know, all different people can be in the kind of community of people that know things. Well, then there's a lot more disputation. <laughs> because a lot of the things they know have been ignored and set aside and not listened to and denied and pretended that they, you know, that is, you know, one of the things where the, in a longer version of this, what I talk, when I start with photography, I end up with the Black Lives Matter, you know, Facebook live streaming and, you know, iPhone captures of police brutality. It's, it's the same thing as the abolitionists, like pe white people in the North don't believe slavery is this brutal. How can we show them, you know, and, and, you know, black people who, who know about police brutality can't convince white people without this special category of evidence. You know, um, this, all those asymmetries of the status of evidence belonging to different groups are like, I completely agree. They're a huge part of this story. But I, I think if you had to choose between, you know, this chaos of um, people who have had kind of a monopoly on being the people who can know things, um, being challenged and, and that leading to chaos or not all of us being allowed to know things, you'd still choose the chaos. Yeah, that's interesting because those aberrational uh, elements of evidence that you allude to, it also sort of bites at existing power structures and makes them crumble a bit. And I think that's where you sort of see that chaos and revolution happening because of the, 
the counter narrative essentially. So that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to weave in a question we received that's got a lot of votes that is along the same lines because obviously your talk has been focused very much on Western civilization and our concept of history, uh, sorry, facts and evidence. Um, the question was, are there any non-Western influences on our own understanding of fact and evidence? Or is this very specific to our legal systems and our cultural systems? Um, there are many such influences. My, you know, I was asked to sort of speak from this class that I teach, which is for law school students who are being trained in, you know, US law and its practice. And I'm an American historian, so it is, I, I don't spend time exploring, uh, doing something comparative. There is a kind of really interesting comparative study of evidence. Um, on the, the cases that I know stuff about are, um, are themselves pretty provincial. Like I know about like continental Europe, <laughs> you know. Um, when I teach the course, I have students pick um, instances where evidentiary claims were disputed and do reports about them, like a little mini report. Uh, and my students tend to pick episodes that come from other countries and other and vastly different times. So I'm trying to educate myself from students' own interests, which are, you know, because the students are from all over the world. They're interested in practicing law in the United States, but they're really interested in some of these comparative questions. Um, they're really interesting, like for instance, um, I just went to a really interesting presentation once on linguistic evidence for um, the ancestry of indigenous peoples. And this was in the US, in fact, but where um, to get federal recognition as an indigenous group, you need to you need to demonstrate a history, right, that goes back to, yeah, I don't know what the rules actually are, but it's very difficult because so much of that history has been destroyed. And these are peoples who did not have writing uh uh historically so um there's a really interesting body of work linguistically that attempts to purport the relationships across groups um that they can that they can um they can be derived by the study of comparison of languages across different groups like they're just i think that's kind of fascinating like that you could make a claim about something that happened in a point in time by the use of you know a changing phoneme or something um so that yeah there's there's like it's infinite. People have infinite ways of thinking about these kinds of things, but uh, I don't have like a whole really great set of anecdotes I can toss out for your person's great questions. Sadly. That's, that's okay. And I, actually, as I was listening to you speak and, I, and, and even thinking about some of your talk around the origin around um, numbers and census and thinking about the Roman Empire and using a census and the Christian origin story comes from a census in, you know, it's far flung regions and think census is very much tied to retaining power, understanding the distribution of power. And, um, and we're seeing even right now politically that the census is, is being put into dispute because of questions around citizenship where they want to maybe even gerrymander what the census is. So I'm curious, uh, as you have this continuum from facts to numbers to data, um, that the numbers themselves are under attack too because they're trying to figure out how power gets distributed based on that. Yeah. I. Um... I wrote a long essay about the census this March, right before the census count. It's called, But Who's Counting? Um, that's a kind of history of the census. Uh, where actually the history of Chinese dynasties is really important to the history of counting, right? Because you have to have, you have, to have uh, enough manpower and enough political heft to, to force people to be, you know, to, to count people. Um, the history of the census is really, 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 really interesting. Um, and in the US really conflicted around um, and, can, you know, embedded in the racial taxonomies that uh, drove immigration policy uh, in, in US history. And I, much of the controversy now is is a continued legacy of um, the embedding of, of racist taxonomies into the work of counting people, that that was always another objective of the census was to taxonomize people. Uh, so it's, it's a very implicated history. Well, here's another popular question uh, from our audience, but I want to preface it with a call out to your last archive podcast, which was terrific. And I enjoyed your Tomorrowland episode, which is the final one of season one, um, and your conclusion around who killed the truth. And you listed number one, Donald Trump, number two, Mark Zuckerberg, number three, postmodernism. And this idea of um, you know how technology is really disrupting things. And so this question is, where does AI fit and AI, AI's predilection to replicate bias? And, you know, I, I think it comes back to, you know, as we rely more and more on data that we sort of lose 
our, our relationship with facts and reality. So AI must figure into some of your, your thinking around this as well. Yeah, I mean, there's some tremendously interesting scholarship on AI, uh, and I am not one of those scholars. It's not, it's, it's not what I do. I know much more about the history of the field than I do about where it's going. Um, but you know, as you know better than than most people, there are also incredible organizations, uh, you know, where you are and across the country that are working on pressing people developing artificial intelligence applications, especially for social purposes, to uh, embed some um, sense of an obligation to the public and to justice and equality into what they're doing. I myself, I'm not so convinced that that is altogether doable. Um, I think the idea that we can code our way out of social problems, I'm waiting to be in the audience at a lecture where someone convinces me of that by giving me instances of it um, that outnumber the instances where we have created and exacerbated social problems by trying to code society. Um, I also think, you know, you might think this just pops into my head of the constitution as a kind of artificial intelligence in this sense that it erects a machinery that is meant to be self-perpetuating that organizes our political life by um, establishing constraints on it um, and setting a set of rules within it. Um, and yet, it is subject to amendment and it is required that we understand it and that even its initial ratification required the consent of the people through an extended process of deliberation, publication and deliberation. Um, so, you know, the nation, this particular nation is founded on the idea that if there is going to be a framework that organizes our life and our political, our that organizes our political life and structures it, um, it should be written down, completely transparent, entirely legible to everybody, debated by the entire population, gone through a ratification process and subject to amendment. So should not the same thing be true? Like if we're going to have predictive algorithms that set bail for people, well, I'm sorry, but it should be, shouldn't it be <laughs> debated by a group of people, then published, then, then sent into convention for the whole of the public to understand it and have it be explained and deliberated over, amended, debated, then ratified. Like, wh why can someone, can a company trying to make money come up with a predictive algorithm to set bail, never tell anybody what's in the code, make money off <laughs> and sell it to, you know, city attorney, attorney justice departments and state, you know, state's attorney general. Um, what? Like, how can that even happen? Like, it's completely inconsistent with our basic philosophy of government. You just blew my mind with you <laughs> pointing out that the U.S. Constitution may be the first instance of an AI or an algorithm that actually works. Right? It's a little benevolent that over time it's gone from white male being able, <laughs> white men being able to vote only who own property to something much more expansive and, and a living organism. And I've actually long argued that we need a constitutional amendment around data that we own our own data, we control our own data. There's gotta be some way that we protect that. And it has to be at the level of constitution. It just can't be regulatory anymore. That's so powerful mm -hmm. and important to us. There, there is, I tell the story in the Simulmatics book about an attempt to do that in 1965, really early, really long ago when it maybe could have happened um, and why it failed. Uh, so. I'll urge that on you. <laughs> All right. Well, on another question listeners. we received um, goes back yet back into that Black Mirror episode, um, Nosedive, which um, is so powerful because it's horrifying. The idea that your your social media um, metrics and essentially dictate the services you get access to, and what people you know what happened very soon after, as we know, the social credit system, which is an experiment in China but rapidly growing based on AI and algorithms, is that um, a concern around uh, what if, what is China doing with that social credit system? And is that actually having any impact in the Western world where we have a different notion around surveillance and privacy? Mm. Um, I, I, I got distracted when you were talking about how disturbing nosedive was, but yeah. I was trying to decide 
I think it's 2011, maybe. It was 2011, when, that's right. And, yeah. and then the social credit system in China, I think, really so, began to take hold yeah. in 2017, 2018. So it was before Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. Um, I got distracted by thinking about whether the future that we have now in 2020 is worse than the one imagined by Black Mirror in 2011. So <laughs> I was like listening to what you were saying about the China thing, but I was like, Wow, I remember when I watched Nosedive, I was like, holy crap, what if we lived in that world? And now I'm like, that world doesn't look that bad compared to this one. I, that's a, a sad, okay. having a sad, sad reaction. Um, I do think that there is, um, I think there, I, I will say two things. One thing, I, I think I may have said this last night, but I'm assuming this is a completely different audience. One thing is that I, I would have thought as a historian looking at past instances of kind of comeuppances of industries that were not broken, but dramatically reformed by a crisis. I would have thought that 2016 would have been that crisis for social media companies, not for, you know, AI companies or predictive, not every, but particular, specifically for social media companies, um, which would have in, which would have resulted in not a constitutional amendment, but at least some toothy um, regulations or a, a more more uh, vigorous national conversation. Um, I think, so I'm still myself as a historian puzzled by, I mean, I understand the incoming administration didn't want to investigate any of that stuff. So just kind of pretended it didn't happen um, and is happy to engage in it, right? As opposed to like it's an arms race, we want more arms. We don't wanna um, have like a strategic arms limitations talk summit. Um, but I still don't really quite understand why there wasn't a kind of great unraveling of social media after 2016. Um, when there was a second thing that I was gonna say about that, but now I can't remember what it was. Well, and social media companies and even tech companies, and you alluded to obviously here in Seattle, we have access to those power brokers. You have somebody like Brad Smith, who's the president of Microsoft, almost begging the government to regulate because these companies are focused on shareholder value and they're going to keep doing that until they're reined back in. But there doesn't seem to be a huge desire to rein them in appropriately. And so this, I think this is what's going on is that the regulators just aren't that interested. And therefore the companies have to continue down that path because mm -hmm. that's how they're, that's their DNA. That's what they've got to do with the data. Mm -hmm. So, do they have to do it? Do they have to do it? Do they have to do it? I mean, ethically and morally, they shouldn't. But from a business point of view, that data, they have, they feel that there's, there's a compulsion is, and they're building these algorithms. Yeah, that, but, 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 but when your business model is completely contravened by any clear headed sense of ethics, then there's a problem with your business model. I totally agree. I totally agree with that. Um, this is a parallel to my original umpire AI question uh, from Michael Pete. He says, is the end result of technology that the rule of law by a jury of our peers will be replaced by Watson, which is the IBM AI, one of the earlier <laughs> ones? <laughs> um, I think um, a more cynical person than I am would say that we are quite a long ways toward that because of police departments that engage in predictive policing even when they don't call it that. Um, so when the criminal justice system involves police departments that decide which part of the city to uh, patrol based on the data that they're you know, running through a computer, which then leads them to make more arrests because they're there more, which then, and they're then, they're tend to, because those neighborhoods are gonna be poor, then they're tend to arrest people who can't get bail. So they're gonna arrest people that don't have good legal, so, that computer is going to lead to those police arresting people who then will charge and they will be charged rather than released and who will likely be convicted and then their computer is going to tell them to spend more time in that neighborhood because there have been a lot of convictions there and we like that is actually how cr criminal justice works um and a lot of police departments have pulled back from doing that because it's been pointed out to them how how indefensible that is, not just ethically, but in terms of good policing. Like it's just bad, it's just bad policing. Um, it's not actually solving problems. Uh, so I, but a lot of them, you know, still do, and a lot of things in our world follow that kind of 
you know, that crappy Tom Cruise minority report <laughs> movie model. We don't, I don't think about them as much. I don't think we think about them or are as aware of them as, as we should be because they tend, the places where they are implemented without question are the places where people are extremely vulnerable. So I have been noticing that there's an awful lot of use of predictive analytics in the foster care world. Um, which child is at risk? Which family, you know, if you're gonna make a decision to remove a child from a family, you know, what, what is your predictive algorithm? Say? It's not like social workers are running the, they're, they're, you know, departments of families and children have been sold these software programs that they have no resources, they have no social workers, the state's completely failing to support these programs. Uh, well, but here's an, here's an app and we're, you know, this will make your work easier. Um, that is Watson doing a trial by jury, isn't it? It's just that we're talking about very poor children and no one's, no one's caring enough to stop that from happening or noticing. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's poignant. Um, my final question to you comes from me having listened to your podcast and it's when I was, a, I grew up in libraries. My mother was a librarian. Um, and one of the tragic stories to me was always the burning of the, the great uh, library of Alexandria. And, and as I was listening to your podcast, I was thinking, you know, maybe the library in the end was meant to burn because are we really, as are humans really meant to have that much access to information? As you look at, as you think about having to create a Google to be able to make sense of all the information that's available to us now, because um, uh, you, you said the machine does that for us now in the podcast, how much information is too much information for us? And is that really the subtext to your, your continuum and your concern right now of going mm -hmm. from facts to data? Yeah, I think the concern that there's too much information goes pretty far back. I have a colleague who does medieval European history who published a book called Too Much Information um, about the rise of print culture. Uh, so it's a it's a not uncommon refrain. But I, you know, I, I, I wrote an essay once about Brewster Kale who founded the Internet Archives um, in San Francisco. And he, you know, thinks about it as a secret library of Alexandria, right? And um, I learned a lot from him about how somewhat, how arbitrary the interface that we have on the web is, right? The, the Tim Berners-Lee World Wide Web experience of the web, that there were other proposals on the table, including one of Brewster's, which he was doubtless trying to convince me was, was better, where um, everywhere you went, you would have a history. You know how on Wikipedia, everything is, 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 is every version is kept for you? So you could always find on Wikipedia what the Wikipedia page used to look like. You can check back at how it's been tinkered with. It has a three dimensionality that most of your experience on the web does not. I'm not talking about like YouTube and all this other stuff, just like the basic old school web. It's great, it's great um, transparency. It's wonderful transparency. It's incredible transparency. So what Brewster's trying to explain to me is that like one of the models for the interface before it was the World Wide Web was this three dimensional thing where you would always see what, what what this page had been before and who had messed with it. And the reason that that didn't fly was people people working in computing still had in their head um, that memory was always gonna be a problem and storage was always gonna be a problem, right? So there's always overwriting. Like early computer people always, over, like there's only so many punch cards, there's only so much magnetic tape, the disks don't carry you. You always overwrite, right? Like so, from the historian's vantage, oh no, don't overwrite. You know, it's not, it's it's not malicious. It's just like you would overwrite because we can't afford to keep this the, the earlier versions. But now we could, we could keep it. Um, but now we're stuck with this thing. And a lot of the information chaos of the early web really was about the lack of context. Even if you think of like, you know, early Yahoo sites or whatever, like you could you could have had that dimensionality, and if then that could have been fortified and made really uh, um, sophisticated and captivating, we wouldn't have like, you know, Google is an incredible, brilliant thing, but it is, it is a massive machine to decontextualize pieces of information from bodies of knowledge. So it's just really like when I teach young people, and I'm sure you've had this experience, you know, teaching like people go and they just like reach down and they pull up something it's like, you can't use that. Like, where did that come from? Like, it doesn't belong in, it, it's a fish that's gonna die in this lake. Like, what pool did it come from on the other side of the planet? Cause it doesn't, 
I can't live with this algae. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> you don't just like yank a piece of information out of somewhere and just like plop it in your paper. Like, what? But that's what, you know, that's the the model for inquiry that Google offers. Whereas the model for inquiry at a library is like, I mean, I always say like when I was a kid, where are the books about sex hidden? Like you, <laughs> you, you have to figure it out. Like go down this aisle, what are these books about? And then like you, it's, it's about discovery and looking at things against one another, um, figuring out the organizing principle. There's a lot of cognitive work around that kind of search that I think is foundational, you know, to making meaning of the thing that you find. So I don't, you know, like, thank God the search is easy. I could find out the answer, you know, very easily. It's like the desk set thing when the Emirac figures out the spruce bug consequence or whatever. Like, that's super helpful. But on the other hand, if you don't know what a spruce bug is, you wouldn't have found out by doing the search. Well, Jill, thank you for making the case for both humanity and serendipity with that final thought. And thanks for <laughs> being so provocative and scintillating with this overall conversation. It was just remarkable. I really appreciate it. And I think we are Super being fun pulled to talk back to into, into reality, okay. even despite being on Zoom or whatever we're using right now. Back into reality, uh, that's a task far beyond me. Um, everybody, if you take but one thing away from the last, uh, I guess it's 81 minutes now, I hope it's that Google is a massive machine to decontextualize information from bodies of knowledge. Um, there it is. Jill and Hanson, that was exhilarating and terrifying all at the same time. I don't know how you did it. Hanson, thank you for stepping onto the fast moving sidewalk of this presentation and these ideas and being an exceptional guide through the issues left standing. Jill, I wanna thank you for your joyful, I took a second to write this down. That's why I'm looking down and not looking at. Um, <laughs> thank you for your joyful curiosity and your gift of synthesis so vividly displayed in your talk and the virtuosic brain so evidently displayed in your Q&A. And I want to thank all of you in the audience assembled tonight for your close attention and your great questions. Um, that is part of your, uh, that is your part, I should say, in the theater of our programs and town hall audiences never fail to perform that role brilliantly. Um, if you had a good time tonight and you want to help us sustain our programs and our values in this year on the financial brink, we hope you will consider an additional gift to Town Hall here now with that demure button I referred to, or reach out to us later at some more convenient time at cadetstownhallcl.org. Um, I want to thank our hardworking Devo team and all the rest of Town Hall's crack staff. We will see you all again very soon in the flesh, but in the sooner, I guess, uh, in this digital way. And if you're a talk of the town, uh, a talk of the town attendee, we will see you all again in just a few minutes. Um, thank you all so much for being a part of tonight. We appreciate it. And bye, Hanson. Bye, Jill. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. That was fun. <laughs>